Hey folks, Vince here along with uh, Jason. We just wanted to give you a quick shout out and a little information that we just found out that some of you might be interested in. Jason, why don't you tell them about that information? So it turns out there's a really good deal right now. Uh, as you might know, we have T-shirts that are available from Roll for Initiative, and we do them through Spreadshirt. Uh, if you go to our website, rfipodcast.com, you'll see a little ad there that says we have T-shirts. Well, when you go and you click on that, uh, if you buy $40 or more, you get a free netbook or laptop sleeve. So that's a custom laptop sleeve that'll fit uh, any la- – they have different sizes for your laptop or for mm-hmm. your netbook. And you can get one with the little Roll for Initiative logo, you know, the first edition AD&D podcast. So you can wear it with pride. And you get that free with any order of $40 or more. All you need to do is go f- to Roll for Initiative – I mean, you know, our podcast, RFIpodcast.com. Uh, follow the links to get a T-shirt. And when you check out – this is important. Enter the coupon code free sleeve and you'll get a free laptop sleeve. So that's a free laptop sleeve with any order of forty dollars or more. This is a great time to go and pick up your roll for initiative t shirts because you get a free laptop sleeve with that. So give it a shot. Definitely pick up a shirt, wear it proud, show it around, and uh definitely advertise the show so more more people listen and play first edition Dungeons and Dragons. Alright, back to the show. D20 Radio, your gamers roll. Roll for initiative. And we're back for issue number 31. That's right, 31 for the Roll for Initiative podcast. And uh, I'm DM Vince, one of your hosts, only one of the hosts, as I'm joined by a plethora of other hosts tonight. DM Jason, as usual, sitting in the background quietly, ready to speak as usual. Jason, how are we? Hey, we're doing good. We've got a couple of uh, extra people here in the New York location tonight. Uh, mm-hmm. They're on mute, so you can't hear them, but we've got our producer, Matt, yep. uh, who's, who's sitting in the background, and also uh, his friend, Julie, from New York. So I uh, just wanted to say hello to both of them uh, who are here, though you can't tell. Uh-huh. No, hello, kidding. Julie, from New York. Oh, and yeah, we have DM Nick, too. Oh, yeah, just me. It's okay. <laughs> and as you heard, that was him. Whatever. <laughs> if you're just listening in for the first time, which some people may be doing because they just found the podcast, this is the Roll for Initiative podcast featuring Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition only. So, <laughs> anything else we don't care about? No, I'm just kidding. You can write us about it. We just won't care about it. And then it's RFI to the FDL. already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh... What's been going on in gaming? Nick, what have you been doing in gaming this week? Oh, nothing. I burned all my gaming stuff and just called it quits. <laughs> no, really. Uh, uh, I can disconnect you from the podcast, then. <laughs> you know, you know, not not a whole lot. Just, uh, you know, uh, getting ready for this week's episode and doing a little bit more on the new campaign I'm hoping to do uh, this fall. I, I kind of alluded to last uh, last time, so yeah. Hope uh, had a uh, have another uh, game night coming up in a few weeks. So with our with our with our guest DM that came in the town, so he's still here. So yeah, it'd be pretty cool. Cool, and uh, it's a good job to have wandering DM. Yes, he he, he roams the earth from table to table, rolling the dice wherever he goes. Have it's D- very kung fu like. <laughs> David Carradine is yeah. the wandering DM. The wandering DM. <laughs> Where dice are rolled, he will show up. Have D twenty will travel. Um, so, uh, Jason, what have you been doing in gaming this week? Uh, pretty busy. I uh, got my my Gamma World box repaired, <laughs> which yeah. was good. I, I learned how to repair a uh, broken, messy old box. That was fun. Really? Um, but uh, it's it's been pretty busy. You know, I've got two campaigns that I'm running right now. There's the Skype game, which we have a bunch of shows or, you know, whatever you want to call it, recorded. Uh, and Matt's going to be putting those up later this week. And then the in-person game as well. And in preparation, we have uh, 
We took everybody on the Skype game through a little diversion into a psionic gladiatorial arena. So uh, <laughs> anybody who listens to the actual play podcast who hears my show will hear all kinds of ways that I got it wrong. So. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, so if you Hopefully want... we will we will rectify those problems tonight. In case you're sitting there going, oh my god, actual play, why don't you go to rfiactualplay.tk and you can uh, listen to all the shows that we have uh, uploaded, uh, mine and Jason's. So. Week in gaming for me, I was running, not running, I was playing in a uh, basic edition D&D game this Saturday. I had a lot of fun with that. And I'm also running uh, a World of Darkness game, Vampire Second Edition. So, so you see, we do care about other games than First Edition. Yes, we, we do. care a lot. Yeah. No songs. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> what Nick was going to sing? He just started to. Oh boy. So uh, let's, before I'm going to yeah. start pulling out TLC references. So don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Moving along, Jason forums. They're up. Yes, the forums are up and running. Uh, hopefully, everybody's having a good experience with them. Uh, we're running a forum plugin called Simple Forum, so uh, or Simple Press, something like that. Yeah, Anyways, uh, they look pretty good. You can put up your own avatar, or you can use a gravatar. Hopefully, everybody's get that working for them. You can follow each other, uh, subscribe to topics, all that kind of thing. If you're using the forums and you're having any trouble at all, please let me know right away because we're still early stages. But it looks like we're getting a lot of uh, uh, traffic on there. So I really encourage everybody to go and uh, you know do a little bit of talking. And actually, now that I say this, I did promise people that I would say hello to the ones that uh, posted early. So I'm going to pull that up while we talk. All right. Um, one other thing I want to say is that the more you post, the uh, higher your – Level will go. Everybody at this point is new, so everybody is a press to digitator. And uh, how do you say that again? Yeah, how do you say that again? Press to digitator, <laughs> something like that. You know, the first level magic user. Press to digitator. Sounds contagious. Yeah, sounds like yep. you got a disease going on there. Uh, but let me let me just take a minute to um, actually say hello to some of the people that did go in and uh, post really early on, and that includes. Max Spookington, PC Buzz, Eric Hello. Waddell, Riley Van, Big Rich, and Chuck. Chuck. So, Chuck. 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 Chuck's actually in my campaign, uh, my actual play. Okay. You know what? Let me just see. What do we say here? Let me tell you who the top posters are right now. Chuck is the top poster on the forums at the moment. Um, and uh, after that, the second highest uh, poster, yeah, press to digitator, press to digitator. Um, after that, <laughs> uh, Todd Hughes, Max Spookington, Death Metal Nightmare, yeah. Arrows, of, Arrows of Chaos, and Eric Waddell. So those are our top posters right now. I just want to give a uh, go right back to that Death Metal Nightmare. Was that? He's awesome. He writes a yeah. lot of really good. Comments. I love that name too, Death Metal. Yeah, Nightmare. I just like his name. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'll promise to uh, put some sepulture comments in every now and then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Talk. Awesome. We'll talk a little entombed, some repulsion. We'll be ready to go. Word. So, yeah. Word. Okay. Anyway. So uh, enough of uh, death metal. That sounded more like that parrot from Hate Beak. <sighs> Jason. You know the death metal band with the parrot that sings. Yeah. Hate yeah. Beak. Yeah. What we Love need is more guar. <laughs> the world needs more guar. Yeah. Uh, so. Did Todd put up another article, guys? I don't, I didn't, I don't remember. I didn't... Oh, yes, yes. There's a new article from Todd. Let me just run and grab that really quickly. Uh, well, no, we, I think we talked about it last time, more human than human. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, his most recent one. And his... He does have another one coming up soon, but uh, that's going to – we'll announce it when it's up. Because he's been very busy, Todd is – because Todd's been very busy working on his new module that he's creating. So uh, there is still a contest going on. You can still send monster designs to Todd, and uh, we'll kind of keep you updated as we get closer to seeing a release on the module that Todd Hughes is actually creating. Yes, definitely. And by the time this podcast comes, uh, a podcast does come out, uh, I should have my next session of Book of Sorrows up. I'm sorry that's been holding off. I'm trying to edit it. It's a little long, so I'm that's to edit- your actual play show. Yeah, I'm trying to edit out the dead air spots because we had two more characters in so it kind of threw everybody off on uh, who could talk now type deal 
You're so much nicer to your listeners than I am. I just put them up. I mean, they're not even up yet, but I've just been saying, you know what? Just throw those things up. Hey, if you want to listen, nice guy, you know, and we know. I'll wait for the complaints. Yeah, I'm, there are people. Which I'm sure there will be some. Remember, that's Jason at RFI. <laughs> rfipodcast.gmail.com <laughs> send your complaints wow that was yeah anyway uh pimping for stars nick you said you had you saw two new reviews up there yeah yeah we got a couple new reviews um actually both of them on september 18th so yeah just a couple of days ago rock on uh we got a review from dm newt dm g n e w t hey Very that's cool. one of my players oh well there you go yeah. Gave us five stars. <gasps> Thank and you. Good that his character can live. It's a hundred experience points. No, uh, <laughs> DM New he says the podcast for a D and D. Well, we t- we try, you know. Um, it's not yeah, it's not for car repair. So I think we hit hmm. the nail on the head. So <laughs> really? anyway, he says an oh. excellent podcast for anyone who loves first edition AD&D or wants to better understand why others love the game. DMs Nick, Jason and Vincent have a lot of fun and passion with the subject as they pass that along to us listeners. Each issue is filled with new ideas and trivia that makes the game more enjoyable. Although they take the game seriously, <laughs> they do not come across as pompous, but rather as guys who like to have fun. Oh, really? So, <laughs> what was that? Nick? I'm just trying to sound pompous. Oh, yeah. yes. Nick, I have a, a 1979 Dodson B210, and whenever I go up a hill, it makes this noise when I try to go into third gear, kind of like a. Can you tell me what's wrong? You need to put your head under the wheel. Anyway, <laughs> wow. I hope RFI keeps going strong for many issues to come. So, that was from DM Newt. Oh. Oh, very cool. Thanks, DM Newt. I just want to um, say, uh, DM Newt, this is our last issue, and oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we try. We don't really take it that seriously, but we just, you know, we're just a couple of guys who have a lot of experience playing, and we're just trying to get back to the community that gave us so much fun, I think, you know? So. Yep. Speak and, for yourself. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Yes, well. <laughs> We just so much know more better than other people. Yeah. We just like to read the books and we never play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, this isn't play fair. Right. Um, the next one is from Sean Kelly, and he gave us <gasps> he gave us four stars. All what? right, finally somebody with some cojones. Yeah. Okay. I'll, he okay. Gave us That's four- cool. Right, delete it. No. <laughs> Really no. But Sean Kelly says, keep it at old school, but not necessarily for old timers. What? So, yep. this is a great cast that uh, caters to first edition AD&D. Three hosts that share the spotlight in an equal manner. Good chemistry. Sound quality is solid. Through these guys, though these guys cater to the older edition of the popular Dungeons & Dragons RPG... Newer players can still gain some valuable insight in the game slash edition, in my opinion, that started it all. I started with this edition and have grown fond of new games, but this show keeps me looking back when the game was a bit different. Creature Feature Theater, just one of the elements of the show features a brief single encounter involved all three of the members, is nice because it provides actual play without the full session and gets you to thinking about how encounters can be run using the AD&D system. So, it's very cool. So Very cool. And, oh, wait, he has more. Oh, oh, <laughs> act now. I'm like, but wait, there's more. And he says their interview with Frank Metzer was, was one you should download right away. Okay. He says, only beef is the reference to 4th edition D and D as the game that shall not be mentioned. It's a big world, and how the do you cast know which is... one we're not mentioning? Yeah, that could be yeah. third edition. It could mm. be second edition. Ah. Yeah, everybody <laughs> could knows be this one. Second edition. It could be chainmail. Ma- she could be chainmail rules yeah, for minutes of fighting. Match. Yeah, could be. It, it could says be... it's a big world, and a cast has their own preference. Just wish the reference was it not was not, was it not equal to the bully. The Pete and your cord flakes back at summer camp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up the good work and try to stay away from the demon known as Podface. 
And that's nice. from Sean Kelly. I like so, it. I mean, overall, pretty good review. I mean... I love it. I love it. And I really do like the uh, fact that he did four stars. I'm not kidding because, you know, I like honesty. So uh, I'm not encouraging anybody to give us low number of stars, but I just, I, I like honesty. So that's great. Yeah, so do I. I do too. I mean, like we've said in the past, though, like about fourth edition. I mean, you know, this is a first edition podcast, but we, we steer clear of that. We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, knock any other edition here. We're just going to focus in on as much as we can on, you know, what, we're, what we like to play here. So no, I'm going to so. knock other editions. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I don't like other editions. I mean, the, I, well, I do like one other edition, but I won't get into that tonight. Send all your hate mail to Vince at podcast. <laughs> no, I don't have an email address at, at RFI Podcast yet. Oh, no. you dog. I just do the RFI staff email. Jason has not set up Vince at RFI Podcast.com yet for hate mail. Okay. But I'm sure he's doing it right now as we're speaking because he's quiet. So. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I try. <laughs> All right, so that'll uh, end our uh, intro, and we'll head over to Sage Advice so we can get into the nitty-gritty of things. Sage Advice. So Sage Advice, without Nick and I singing this week, because we have bumpers, as we were reminded last week. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jason? <laughs> Indeed. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Here I was going to go on America Got Has Talent, and no, I'm not well, going to. You, know, you can sing all those emails come flying in from across the sea. Eh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so first letter tonight comes from DM Joe. Is it the DM Joe? No, it's not the DM Joe. I wish it was the DM Joe. He says, great, guys, great podcast. Haven't played in years, but 1E and Modified 2E were what I played, and it's great to hear that they are still alive. I investigated 4E when it came out because I was curious. It might be an okay game for some people, but it's not D&D. Question, do you give maximum hit points at first levels or go with a random roll? Uh, Question. It's a good question. Depends on the, D- the DM, but I usually do give max hit points at first level, just to be nice. Nick? Nick, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, they Everybody starts with one hit point, no constitution modifiers. <laughs> Suck it up, man. Wow, dude, that's No, stinks. honestly, I start with uh, maximum hit points with, if any, of applicable constitution modifiers. I just think it gives the players... The, the player characters a little bit better of a chance at first level, especially yeah, the executes. <laughs> I don't do max. I don't do maximum hit points because um, I don't know. I, I I don't feel right doing that. I feel like I'm fudging it a little bit. But at the same time, I can't be so heartless as to have a fighter with one hit point, you know, at first level. So my rule is you roll, but if it's under half of your well, hit yeah. dice, you roll again. This actually is a, leads up to our next email that we just got in that's probably going to help out with this question as well. Oh, nice segue. Uh, Jason, you're going to get that one from Joshua? Oh, right. So uh, Joshua Cameron writes in, and he says, One question. Will you ever get into house rules that people use to make the game better for their group? One small, <laughs> one small example that I have concerns hit points. Uh, by raw... Rules is written. Oh, okay. I thought he meant Robert Anton Wilson. I didn't know. No, he would not mean that. <laughs> well, I would if I wrote the word letters raw in all capitals. Uh-huh. By Robert Anton Wilson. When no, a Jason. Cre- <laughs> when a character is created or levels up, they roll the appropriate hit die or dice and add that total to their current maximum HP. Uh huh. That's great. Hold on. By, oh, yeah. Okay. But that's by the rules as written. Um, but this is great if a player happens to roll high. But what if they get boned and roll a one? They have no hope of ever getting anything else out of that hit die save getting hit with an energy drain and reacquiring the level. My solution borrows from the original edition of D&D. Each level, a player rolls their total hit dice plus bonuses. And if it's greater than their old max HP, that's their new total. If they roll less than what they currently have, they keep their old total. Um, All right. So, um, well, okay. That, that example, that's great for, for, for your group. Uh, I guess this is a good time to talk about that, though. I think we should do, you know, at some point, maybe we should start soliciting from our listeners, you know, everybody's favorite house rules. I know we've all got them. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, I do my initiative differently. I, I actually 
use a, a segment of action version of initiative that I've kind of cribbed from a couple different dragon magazines and a few ideas of my own. So, you know, I'm, we all have something like that. We just talked about how we do our hit dice. So, uh, yeah, I think we should get into house rules like that at some point because it's a big part of, you know, playing AD and D is everybody has a little bit of a house rule. That's a very good point. Yeah. I, I know I do it. I think that was everything, uh, that I've experienced in my past is, and I think I wrote about this on Grognardia. There was a kind of there was a thing on Grognardia that that uh, uh, blog by James Mazalewski out there in uh, Canada, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, he did a thing just a couple of days ago. It was like the long shadow of AD and D, oh, and just talking about people and their experiences with AD and D. And one of the things I thought is a really cool aspect of AD and D is the ability to. Um, uh, house rule it, you know? Well, I mean, that's the thing is that AD&D, the, the, the history of it coming into place was that before there was an advanced Dungeons & Dragons, every single game of D&D was different. You really couldn't go from one table to another and play the same game, and it was an attempt to try to bring some structure and actually have everybody play the same rules. But, I mean, you weren't going to have that happen just 100% 180 degree turnaround so you still have that spirit of original D&D where people do their own thing and I guess that's kind of the strength of it is that it is a little bit of each yeah one of the things I talked about in that I, I, I responded was one of the cool things I don't think they intended it with the rules was it was modular I mean the core rules were essentially the same as far as the basics of combat and the Vancian magic system and a couple other things. But there was other things that if you wanted to use them or not, say, like, you know, unarmed combat, if you don't want to use that system, that's okay. The yeah. whole system's not going to come crashing down around you. <laughs> or Yeah, I think that's the important thing is, is that changing one part, as long as you recognize what the core is, isn't going to, like you say, bring it all crashing down. No. Yeah, yeah. So what do you guys do with the one hit point and they get bone situation? Stand or let them roll again? Hmm. I let them roll again. I, I use, I'm nice. I'll go, all right, I'll let you roll again, but if you get a one, it's a one, so. Yeah, I think that sounds that sounds fair. Yeah, if I, if they came up with a one, I would say, yeah, re-roll it. But the second time around, if it comes up with one, like, psh, hey, dice fall where they may. True. Jason? Yeah, so if if um, it's at first level, like I said, I'm still going to let them roll, but they have to roll at least half of their hit die or else they get to roll again. But after first level, I just go ahead and say whatever you roll is what you get because it it, it makes getting – if you're on an eight-sided hit die, it makes getting that eight so much more wonderful if you know that there was a chance to get a one. Okay, that makes sense. I could go – yeah, especially at higher levels. I mean, are you going to have them re-roll at, like, 12th level 1? <laughs> or, I mean, at, like, ninth level or whatever? I mean, past name level doesn't matter anyway. I mean, they're right, not going to exactly. be doing die rolls as it is. I mean, it's just and a the hit thing point is, plus you can always go back. Is. You, you you can always go back if you get a wish spell or something yeah. like that. Well, you know it what? just gives you some... Guys, why don't we, why don't we kind of save stuff. all this good discussion for another podcast to feature this? Yeah, we should do a show just on house rules. We definitely yeah. should. Yeah, so let's yeah. let's let's just uh, let's save this for another time, and go on to our next letter. Nick, you you got the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tommy Winners. Hey, Tommy. <laughs> Tommy boy. Uh, he writes in and says, "Hey guys, great show. Could you do me a favor and do a show on how to play Magic users? Thanks." Well, Tommy, no. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> yes. We, we don't take requests. No. We only do requests. That's all we have no, to I'm do. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know, that might be a good show. You know? Yeah, we could... absolutely. Well, we did it on a thief and we did a clerk. Now let's do a magic user. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Makes sense to me. Why don't we do that uh, next couple of weeks? Who knows? We'll see I mean, when. Yeah, oh, definitely. We have a, a nice heated thing coming up for next week, but I'm not going to tell the listeners. I'll just tell you guys once we get off the air. Okay, oh. I can't wait to find out what it is. <laughs> we got a heated thing coming up in a, in a little bit. Nick, don't ruin the surprise. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying what it is. I'm just saying. In fact, when we write the show notes, don't even put it in the show notes. 
Let's make nice. it a total surprise. Okay. All right, so uh, that'll end the Sage Advice. If you have any questions or comments, uh, rfistaff at gmail.com, and we'll head into our guest spotlight. All right, so tonight on the guest spotlight, we have a very special guest. We have Jonathan Cruz from epicwords.com. Uh, hello, Jonathan. Yeah, hello, how's it going? Good. Great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, having me on. So for uh, all of our listeners out there, epicwords.com is something that uh, at least I first heard about thanks to some great flyers that were going around at Gen Con. <laughs> and uh, we've been using um, on our actual play show for our Skype game as well as for our in-person game. And uh, I'll let Jonathan explain really what it is, but it's a tool that we've been using to manage our campaign and uh, to keep everybody in touch and especially to make sure that people know when they're supposed to show up for their game. So uh, it's a great tool. And Jonathan, why don't you just go ahead and kick it off by introducing what Epic Words is and just giving us a little background. All right, sure. Uh, Well, in a nutshell, Epic Words is, as we put it, the uh, home for your RPG. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an online campaign journal, blog, wikis, a forum for you to have discussions and stuff. We also provide tools for campaign management, including managing party loot, experience points, scheduling game sessions, and stuff like that. Uh, And pretty much at a a high level, that's that's what it is, and we keep adding more and more features as as we get requests. So the first thing, actually, I should point out is what you just said sounded like a really rich, complicated site. And the first thing I want to make sure that people know is that it's it's not complicated. Um, No. Because when when I went... There's some sites like you know, RPGtools.net that have amazing stuff, but I still haven't, like we talked about last week, taken the time to learn how to do all these things. Whereas uh, with Epic Words, it was just a matter of going in and saying, this is my name. This is the name of my gaming group. Here's the people who are going to play. And it was pretty much that was it. Yeah, we want to keep the site as simple and user-friendly as possible, for sure. So... Um, the first thing, let's kind of run down through some of the different things that Epic Words does. So the, one of the ones that I find most valuable is the calendar. You can go in and actually remind people when they're playing. Yep. Uh, so, and, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm prompting you to, to toot your ah, horn. <laughs> toot my horn? Well, that's what I do best. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, we have all sorts of scheduling uh, tools and notifications for uh, – per suggestion from one of our users was to notify people three days, one day, and more importantly, the day after a game session happens. And because that day after notification is super important because that's when you need to recap and go over the summary of what happened last session. So you don't forget. It's really good because in our Skype game, all of the players have been keeping their blogs in character. So, and I think it's one of the reasons is they get that notice afterwards, and it reminds them go and you know do your blog. Exactly. And I find that really fun. Uh, the other thing is, I think with the scheduling, when I saw that, I was like, this guy knows gamers because you remind people so many times. <laughs> <laughs> That's very the, important, yeah. Seriously, yes. that's the hardest thing for, I think, any gaming group of people who are uh, not living in the same dormitory in college. I mean, anything beyond that, people are busy, their lives are hectic, and the biggest trouble with any gaming group is getting everybody to actually show up for the session. Oh, that, that happened just last time with our group. Oh, yeah. it was It was a pain. We usually either call or email, but even then... Last moment, there was like two people in the group. They're saying, "Well, they can't make it because they, they have car problems." I'm like, "Why didn't they call me? <laughs> <laughs> I could have picked them up." <laughs> yeah. So I mean, getting those yeah. reminders makes a big difference, you know, for that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and, and I've had those same experiences myself, and, and all my own experiences with gaming and gamers really is what drives a lot of the site's features and stuff like that. So you, you can absolutely tell that this stuff is important in real life. <laughs> so let's see. So some of the other things on here, um, obviously you can, you can friend people that are in your group, uh, mm. sending private messages back and forth, all that type of stuff. Uh, but the blogging I think is the most obvious thing that everybody sees because um, it's very easy for you when you're looking at this, this uh, dashboard 
like right now I can look at my campaign activity and I see uh, which char- who's been replying to forum threads. I see that you know one of my characters just put put up a blog post um, which he wrote about his death <laughs> in the mm. game. Nice. Uh, you know that dashboard really helps getting everybody to see exactly what's going on here. Yeah, and that's an important feature to just kind of get a broad view of uh, what's going on in the campaign at a high level, but, at least. But when it gets into some of the other tools, so you've got things like you know, tracking experience and loot, um, and the experience I find really useful because um, it's just one of those things that I think makes a game so much better if you're actually tracking experience points uh, accurately as opposed to just going, ah, I guess you guys are all leveling up tonight. You know, it kind of takes some of the fun out of it if they haven't really, you know, earned that step by step. And, and you know, the points don't mean something. So so those experience points are good. But uh, how much does this differ? Because Epic Words supports every game system. So how much do those uh, unique features differ from one game system to another? Well, at a high level, a lot of them are the same. So things like X, XP. So every game system has some kind of experience points, karma, uh, advancement points, whatever they call it. But there, there's something. It's a number that you keep track of. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it's we try to keep it very generic, uh, especially like with the loot. So you can pick your own currency and weigh, weigh things the same way, whichever way you want. We try not to you know, favor any one system over another. So one of the things that when I first set up my games, you know, you you have to pick what game system and what campaign world you're in. So uh, I'm running a, home, a homebrew game. I'm not running specifically in, you know, Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms or anything like that. Uh, and then I had to pick the system, which when I first did it, uh, there was no option for homebrew first edition AD&D. And uh, I wrote to you, uh, Jonathan, I wrote to you like, I don't know, sometime around eight o'clock in the evening, I think it was. <laughs> and about 15 minutes later, you had emailed back and said, hey, I've just changed that fundamental part of our system. There you go. Yeah, that's that's because wow. that's all I do every night. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, you have no life. I wow. This is what I do. <laughs> you did the same thing. Hey, I don't have a life either, so that's OK. I'm just yeah. saying <laughs> you're married. Well, with so, children. That's really, so that's really cool. Um how many? How often do you update and add different things for different systems? Uh, I get uh, like two or three requ- uh, requests a week for a different system or a different uh, uh, setting uh, that people want for for their games, but but not too often. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, most of the people have already been taken care of. Like all the Dungeons and Dragons settings and and whatnot are pretty much all set at this point. So. How, how, how much? What do you do differently when somebody is setting up a, a different campaign setting? Because you've got different, uh, you've got different options. You can actually choose whether you're doing it for, like I said, in Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms. So, what difference does that make to the actual Epic Words account? Uh, well, at the moment, not much. Uh, what <laughs> it does provide is uh, a setting-specific kind of forum, where if you have questions about the setting, it, and you post to that forum that form will show up in everybody's dashboard who has a campaign in that setting. We don't have a lot of users using that, but we're hoping to expand that set of features uh, going forward. So that kind of leads into the latest thing you've added with uh, living uh, campaigns. Yes, exactly. And how is that working? Uh, Well, it's, we're still developing it. So, um, we're, we still just have a preview at this point, but we're hoping to uh, demo it to certain game companies uh, who are interested in, in using that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But it's definitely kind of in, not even a beta. It's alpha at this point. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, tell me a little bit about how you, you know, decided to start doing this site and, uh, you know, how you went about setting up. How long has it been around? Uh, it's been around since 2008. Uh, I think oh. 2008 Gen Con is when we de- debuted, so uh-huh. just over two years. Um, what it really – it started from a necessity. Uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I, really? we had a D&D game where uh, we were asked by the DM to write up a journal in character after every session. And we were doing it by hand in a, a pen and paper book. And passing mm-hmm. it around uh, between players, 
and that seemed a little tedious to me. So I wanted I wanted to find an online tool that would let me do that uh, digitally without um, with some permissions, so that the GM would have some way to manage this stuff and something with a maybe a gaming flavor. But I couldn't find that online, so I decided to just make it myself. <laughs> So did you do this, I mean, was this built uh, on some other existing uh, platforms, or did this kind of get built from the ground up? Uh, pretty much from the ground up. Uh, wow. I, I have some wow, uh, open source pretty... tools that I, that I use to develop it, but uh, most, for the most part, it's uh, handwritten by myself. That's amazing. That's so you, you, you wrote the CMS yourself, basically? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's wow. It's wow. really impressive That's because you know, when a, you're using it, yeah. you don't know. I mean, it just it's it seems it's running so well that I just sort of assumed there was several years of uh, bug fixing, you know, behind this thing. Uh, no, but I continually bu- fix bugs and and whatnot. As, especially as new features come out, there's always little hiccups and stuff. And um, we come out with new features. We we let them kind of sit in the wild for a while. Uh, I tell a few people who maybe have requested those features to try them out. And as that, as they use those, they say, "Oh, hey, I tried this. It didn't quite work, or didn't work the way I expected." And I fix those. And then once I feel like they've been out in the wild for a while, I will officially announce it. And that's when you get those big emails with the, "Hey, check out the new feature," kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I I noticed today. Oh, by the way, this is Nick. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I was I was poking fun at you about the whole life thing, but you know. We're gamers. That's what we do. But, oh, um, yeah. you know, what the three things that stood out for me on, on the website, besides noticing that you got a, any awards nomination in just this year, which is awesome, by the way. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. for that. And, and I could see why, because the, the website is clean, meaning it, there's not like a whole lot of bells and whistles and, you know, a lot of flashy stuff, which makes it easy to navigate which is the second thing and it's got a great search engine. So if you want to search for a campaign that's based in first edition AD and D just, you could go right to it and read all the different journal uh, posts or what have you. So that's, I mean, I just love, it's easy to navigate. It's everything is right there. So kudos to you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, that's actually one of my favorite things is to kind of go through and see what people are writing and check out all the different journals. It's, it's amazing that, that so many people are using it and, and have such a variety of stories and stuff on there. Yeah. I mean, that's a... Totally fun. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying it must've been quite the pleasant surprise to be a, uh, nominated for an any, that must've been pretty cool. Oh yeah, it was it was super exciting. The first time I'd ever even been to the Ennies Awards at Gen Con. I've been going for ten years and I haven't even checked it out. And it's it's super cool. Uh, everyone's super friendly. Uh, it, it was just amazing to be part of that that experience, that scene. It, it's uh, pretty neat. Yeah, congratulations awesome. for that. Thanks. So so um, of all the systems on there, have you have you ever have you encountered anybody who's come into you with any requests that just couldn't be met? Um, yeah, there are a few. If you go way back into the features, uh, feature request, uh, forum, you'll see some way in the back that I just, there, there aren't too many that, that I couldn't, I can't remember offhand what it is, but I couldn't quite do it or, or they're asking for the moon. They wanted something that would allow me to, I don't know, manage their characters in every system that they ever wrote. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> with every rule system and have it you know, configurable character sheet kind of thing. And it just wanting the impossible. Yeah. I, I, I can only do so much, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you I mean, you got to follow the 80, 20 rule, right? Yeah. And that's basically what it comes down to is my, a lot of the requests are simple. Like, Oh, I just want, you know, a little tweak to this or change the wording on that. And I'll be like, Oh yeah, no problem. And I can sometimes even knock those out in the same day, but occasionally someone asks for the moon and it's, yeah impossible so where are what are some of the things that you you're going for in the future stuff you're you know ready to talk about obviously well okay so one of the things i'm uh hoping to get out there soon is a a chat so that people kind of have a little chat room in their campaign and then post the chat log to either your journal or wiki or something 
Um, oh, you mean like a real-time chat? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, we're also looking at having a, a system for player-seeking games, game-seeking players, um, possibly based on location or if people are doing online or Skype like games like you guys play. Uh, mm-hmm. Just a way for people to sort of just see who's out there and who's looking for, for games. Because people, f- people are using the forums on there now for that, right? Yeah, a few people are using that. I think uh, there are definitely even better ways of, of doing it than just a forum because it, it helps to have a sense of who's nearby. And, and we're, we've been trying to collect uh, location information, like type your zip code or postcode if you're in Canada. And so we can kind of geographically uh, sort people and, and get that stuff. Yeah, yeah. What about are you doing anything with uh, cons right now? Uh, we we are talking about having a sort of a platform for game days or mini conventions kind of thing mm-hmm. um, and possibly integrating that with a, a, a system for game stores to sign up and and showcase the store as as a gaming venue so that you can like reserve tables if you have like weekly night weekly game nights or something um or message their their uh customers and let them know that you know they got a special this week or something Uh, um so that's one of the tools we definitely have uh coming down the pipeline uh, we have the uh, organized play, the, the living campaign stuff that you had mentioned before. Um, and and in, di- in addition to all that, we have all sorts of incremental tools, uh, tweaks and improvements over the existing tools that, that we are planning to come up with. Cool, cool. Yeah, definitely. If you uh, Let us know if you do anything for conventions because, you know, we're getting a convention ready for next year. So whatever tools we can think of to use are going to be helpful. Excellent, excellent. Um, it, it's uh, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. We'd love to have uh, feedback because half our features are always driven by player requests or user requests to, to uh, what they need and what what they'll find useful, and that has helped us a lot in in directing our our own work. Awesome. So, uh, last thing for me to ask you, and this is a little bit. You don't have to say anything special because we're a first edition show. But what what which games uh, do you yourself play? Uh, I myself have played all sorts of games from second edition on in D anD. D. I used to years and years and years ago play first edition, but it's been uh, a couple of decades now. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of a Deadlands campaign, Savage Worlds. Good game. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. It's, it's a fun fun system and fun setting. Yeah, Vince and I were just talking about that that system yesterday. My favorite thing in that system is the the undead tumbleweed. <laughs> yes, there's an undead tumbleweed. I haven't, yes, yeah, I haven't thrown that at my players yet, but uh, maybe someday. It's the funniest. <laughs> I want to use, use that. Yeah, it's the funniest thing to use. You have to use it. Oh god, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what else? We're, we're we've been moving a lot into Savage Worlds. Uh, we do like the the rule system for for the simplicity that that reminds us of like the old A D and D style games and the lighter weight rules and stuff like that. So we we had just come off of playing a campaign in the edition that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> whatever we, edition that might be. Yeah, that's right. Whatever that is. Yeah. Um, right. And our players and, and game master have had a lot of frustration. There's a lot of disconnect between the mechanics and the and the, I guess the feeling, the role playing. So it's mm-hmm. we, we we've got issues with that too. So we we totally hear you guys. <laughs> well, cool. Um, well, thank you so much for for uh, uh, joining us to talk about EpicWords.com. It's a pleasure, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on the show. It's awesome. You guys are great, and keep up the good work. Yeah, and if you want to stick around for the rest of the show, we can uh, we can we can keep you on. It's uh, sure your call. Thing. I'll try not to make too much noise. <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll ask your opinion. Totally blind sign you on something. It'll be great. Yeah, wait till you hear. Our, wait till you hear our next section. If anybody ever thought AD and D had any simple rules, we'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Don't ruin it, Jason. I'd uh, love to stay on and, and chime in when I can. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be cool. great. Please do. Please do. Okay. All right, so we'll, we're heading to Table Matters. 
typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. All right, table manners. And this week we're going to talk about psionics. Woo! Yay! I think. Yay. <laughs> what well, one one would hope. <laughs> so anyway, psionics. You know, it's something it's a part of that system in the appendix of the player's handbook where they all kind of look at and they go, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, let's skip over to see if we want to do the bard. So <laughs> <laughs> that's usually what I do. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, really, I I I like the concept of the psionic system. I like the it concept. It gets a bum rap. It does get it a bum does. rap. It does. We've had does. a few people write in and say that to us, and they're right. It, it doesn't necessarily deserve that. So I'm glad we're doing yeah. this segment. Yeah, I, it's kind of, it's kind of reminds me of when we did the fiend folio segment. You know, after right. we went through it and we went, wait a minute, the fiend folio is awesome. Yeah, it's well, got some great monsters. I mean, I even said that. I mean, just I was just throwing the flump out there just because it's kind of silly in my opinion. But yep, psionics. It, you know, I think it helps define in in the as far as the game system and one of the guidelines of going with beyond the the player's handbook and the DMG is. An excellent issue of Dragon Magazine, which is um, from October of 1983, issue number 78. Indeed. Um, a must-have for some, anybody who's playing yeah. science. If you want to have a great issue to try, I mean, there's a really good article in there, I think, by Arthur Collins. Mm-hmm. He does a fairly decent job of trying to explain the psionic system uh, to everybody to and and also brings up some of the problems in the system mm-hmm. and so one of the things I liked out of the article is he starts off right from the bat is let's explain what psionics actually are I mean what's the difference between that and magic and I think he does a very good job as and it might seem kind of elementary is Magic is the manipulation of forces from outside the mind from someplace else. The magical energy, whatever you want to call it. You know, mojo, man, you know? You're, you're, you're channeling the power from the from the outer planes. Well, well psionics we're... might be actually the mojo. It comes from your mind. <laughs> so that's that's mm-hmm. the difference. I mean, magic... Yeah, it's that whole thing people used to say about how you only use 10% of your brain, and so what's that other 90% right. doing? Well, in this fantasy game world, Ooh. that other 90% is this untapped potential to do amazing things, if you right. get it. Right, so I think that helps a little bit to just define what psionics is. It's the manipulation of the potential psychic forces of the person's mind versus what magic is, the manipulation of outside energies uh, either be it divine or or otherwise divine magic yes. or whatever. The, so. He does a really good example in this article. I think a good metaphor for this when he talks about the fact, first of all, that not just because something uh, can be done magically or psionically doesn't mean everything can be. Some stuff is right. so powerful that your mind is not going to be able to do it. A wish spell for example. So that's right. why the psionic disciplines are specifically limited. But for those that can be done both ways, so detect uh, good or evil, the example yes. that he gives in there I really like is that, yes, you could do it with just the power of your mind or you could take it a little bit easier and go the magic user or the clerical route and you know channel these energies. And his metaphor is you can do – uh, you can make a perfect pitch, a perfect tone using a tuning fork, and that's mm-hmm. like a magic user who's channeling that. Or if you really you know, didn't have a tuning fork and you were able to do it, you could sing that pitch, but it's a lot more work. Right. And that's kind of the difference between using something as a magic spell versus using it as a psionic power from your own mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Those are, and those are good examples of the article. Now, I'm kind of going to be going. I'm going to be going back and forth bet- between the whole magazine here because there's such good nuggets of information about psionics and the issue. 
I mean, oh, I mean, their yeah. sage advice alone. I mean, yes, that... the sage advice it was just I was going to bring up is yeah. really good on this. Um, it's like good four pages of sage mm-hmm. advice that Dragon Magazine or TSR at the time got in about psionics. Doesn't surprise me in the least that there was that much stuff. They're probably oh, yeah. more. Uh, but one of the things that uh, was drawn to me in the sage advice was the issue of, I think the next topic is, as far as besides, you know, what is psionics? Well, who has psionic ability? Or at the, or I should say, the potential of psionic ability. Because not everybody's just going to have it right off the bat. You know, there's there's some mechanics that are involved with of the potential of getting psionics. Now, according to the rules... As written, humans, dwarves, and halflings have the potential of having psionics. Now, just the idea of a halfling having a mind blast ability is just kind of funny in itself. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of cool, you know. But there is in the sage advice where it says which player character races in the AD&D game can possess psionic ability. And I'll quote this. And I think this is very important because apparently there was some ambiguity uh, after some time. And I quote, human dwarves, human dwarven and halfling player characters are allowed the chance to have psionic ability. Initially, in earlier editions of the monster manual, elves, or at least leader type elves, were also included in this group. But right. in later editions of the AD&D books, elves were defined as non-psionic. Uh-huh. So, mm-hmm. based on this ruling, Roger Moore's article on elves in issue number 60 of Dragon Magazine stated that elves had a brain structure that prohibited them from having psionics. So, in earlier version of the games, elves had it. Mm-hmm. Later editions, as the current rules were written, they were nine psionic, but somehow the monster manual <laughs> kind of well, I mean, that's one of the cracks. things historically is the Monster Manual was the first book to be written. Right. So and then, um, later on, but, I mean, I won't say it now, but there's there's some specific uh, actual contradictions between right. some of the things in the Monster Manual and the Player's Handbook, and that is exactly that's what you're definitely one of them. Yeah. Now it goes on from there. Now, well, I just wanted uh, to point out real quick that you, the differences you're talking about is a lot of people believe that. The original Monster Manual was manufactured for uh, original Dungeons and Dragons, and then imported back over to Advance when they actually wrote it out. That could yeah, be why that was. I've one always of the wanted to. I've always wanted to get a little more history on that exact time, but that's for you another know. day. Yeah, that that was one of the reasons. Well, I should say one of the rumors that I've heard about it. So go on, Nick. Now here's so, it gets a little more interesting. Now there's even he says. Say else that brain structure that prohibited him from having psionics. Now, that's according to Roger Moore, who was the editor yeah. of Dragon right. Magazine. Right. Now, then it goes beyond that. It goes, however, judging by E. Gary Gygax's comments and additions in later articles, most notably the featured creatures and astral plane articles in number 67, it would seem, after all, that elves can have psionic ability. Thus, player character elves should be allowed the chance to be psionic, and so by assumption, should half elves. So, there you have it on that one, as far as who has it. Well, you so, know, just just on a little bit of a note, in addition to that, if you go back to Arthur Collins' article, uh, he even says, um, I, 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 uh, I've been told that monks and druids cannot use psionics, but I can't find a reference to this. And then the editor comes in and says, well, actually, that's because monks and druids were prohibited in the original D&D game rules, Eldritch Wizardry, but this restriction has been lifted. So even while people were sitting there at Dragon Magazine writing articles about this, they were going, wait a minute, what's, what, what's the deal? And the editor had to come in and explain it. So in, right, in print, know, just, in print. Well, yeah. I mean, once you delve deeper into this, you're getting to a barrel full of Sioux monsters. You know, <laughs> I mean, here's another psionic creature for you, folks. Yeah. Um, so even then, is when you get into the rules, like what races are allowed to have psionics? I mean, it really sounds like um, pretty much almost any of them have the potential of having psionics. So, well, I mean, not any except of except for half orcs. A gnome. Half orcs or gnomes cannot. But right. it sounds like humans, dwarves, halflings, half elves, and elves can. 
ironic so. because I've been making a list of all the things I did wrong when playing psionics with my uh, Skype group the other night, and one of the top ones is I let the gnome have psionics. <gasps> oh, yeah, man. but then again, they were it was it was a uh, sand lot, so I mean it didn't really matter. Nothing that happened in the uh, gladiatorial arena was actually happening. Cool. It was all a dream. So he had a dream that he had psionics. That's yeah. Ah, uh, well, that's a good dream to have. Yeah. <laughs> it was all a dream. But but so so we're getting into a lot of the things, and I think this is where the whole question of you know is psionics a good thing to have in your game or not comes from is that there's a lot of ambiguity, like you say. If you just look at what's written in the books, a lot of questions are left unanswered. There's even some contradictions that come from book to book. Um, yes. Which I'll actually tell you about after the creature feature. Um, and so I think for some people, it's a combination of three things. One is, to be fair, psionics are pretty difficult to get your head around the first time you ever play them. There's a lot of rules, and there's math, and there's a lot of that stuff. So that's yeah. the first part. They're just hard. That's probably the reason I the, avoid them. The, the, yeah, the math thing makes what, you makes mean, my head hurt. The math to just <laughs> get the ability you're talking about? What's that? <laughs> the math just to figure out if you can get the ability is what you're talking well, about? Well, that, and I think really as you're playing. So, I mean, I sent you guys a, a little thing that I made here, a psionics worksheet. Um, yes. Where I sort of addressed the math issue. And what I did in that is I took a cue from uh, Battletech in terms of since we're talking about a point system here, I was like, well, let's, you know, approach that. Oh. Um, but and, and we'll talk <laughs> about the sheet and sheet in just a moment. It looks um, like But a... that leads to the other thing I think problem that people have. Um, aside from the ambiguity, is that the very flavor of psionics is so different from everything else in AD&D. Yeah, that, I think that throws off some people as far as like, it, they, they feel like it doesn't really fit in with the whole fantasy genre, but... Well, at least the AD&D know? one. And I think that's right. the thing. Gary Gygax, mm. in a, more than one occasion, talked about why... AD&D does not have a spell point system. Mm-hmm. And yet here is essentially a spell point system. If these it kind of is. You know, so you've got a point system. Uh, in psionic combat, you're not doing any rolling. You're just measuring on a table against each other. Um, and, and like you say, then there's also the whole flavor of it where it feels maybe a little bit more sci-fi. People have said it feels like Jedi Knights that mm-hmm. are doing things. Right. I don't see a problem with Jedi Knights. I think they're pretty great. After all, Star, Star Wars Saga Edition is the best game out there, right? Um, that's <laughs> just a hello to everybody at Order 66, actually, who... Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Nice um, plug. Yeah. Hey, no... <laughs> They're a good podcast, and they said things about us the other day, so that was cool. Um, oh, okay. Anyway, so 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 back to back to this. Um, so so there's that, and then there's the there's the inconsistencies. So you have to get over those three things. But I think once you get past those three things, as I've found out playing a bit more psionics lately, you discover this really cool addition to the game that, if you work it in the right way, I think can make a D and D. Uh, even more fun. Right. I think psionics works as far as like the feel of it when you are playing in a type of 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 campaign world okay. that is like a Thunder of the Barbarian type world or Yeah, you know, more swords and sorcery sandal and sorcery kind of thing. Yeah. Like a Thunder of the Barbarian kind of thing. You or know, the Herculoids or something world or Remember the Hercules? Yeah, yeah. Um, a little bit more a, like a post-apocalyptic kind of thing, mm-hmm. which honestly, again, Jason said, you know, Dying Earth Saga is really that. It is, you know, it's a post, way post-apocalyptic kind of <laughs> Do you know that, uh, and, Nick, did, one sec, did you know, speaking of Thunder the Barbarian, that was supposed to be the year 1994? Oh my God, really? Yeah, because they say in the year 1994... <laughs> The beginning oh my of the gosh, show. Wow. I, love that. Wow. I, was, I, I love that show. I was just watching it. Uh, okay, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead. No, that's I cool. Just, I, I, just like I think future. psionics, as far as like a campaign world, that if you're going to create, I think can work in a setting like that along with regular magic, you know? Uh, but, you know, if you're talking like a high fantasy, more influenced in a Tolkien esque kind of way, not so much. You Which know? AD&D I mean, is you not. You can use it, but. 
I mean, you that's know, the thing right there is AD&D is definitely not a Tolkien-esque setting. No. Well, it depends on how you play it, you know? True, I mean, but, I mean, I'm just kind of going again here by uh, a lot of the stuff that's been written in Dragon Magazine that, you know, where people who started the game have talked about. Um, and I, I might be wrong here, but I remember Gary Gygax specifically saying that he didn't even like Tolkien. Oh, I know. I'm just saying for the individual DM, when they create their campaign world, you know, right. going beyond right. that, when they, if they're, yeah, you know, every good DM to manipulates the system, uh, to what they wanted to use it for. So I'm just saying it works in depending on what kind of game world that you're going to make, you know, beyond. Yeah, and if, if you're playing the, in a Jack Vance kind of world, I mean, his world was actually set in the very, very, very distant future. So yes, yes. Th- Thundar. So mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there you go. 1994. Yeah. In, or, so if you remember the, 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 or if you remember Korgoth of Barbaria, the one episode they did on Adult Swim. Oh, which I, was I really don't, but cool. <laughs> look for it. Look for it All on right. YouTube. Right. It's, so, it's, so, like, it's like uh, Thundar and Acid. So. so maybe it would be worthwhile to just take a, a moment to, to examine the kind of underlying structure of psionics, the way it's set up. Yeah, yeah. You know, since, should... since if somebody just looks in the back of the book, you just like any other uh, core rule book, you're going to see a whole lot of stuff that you have to read through and kind of parse and maybe take some notes before the shape of the whole thing becomes clear. Yep. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of describe the psionics worksheet that I put together. Yeah, go ahead. And we will, yeah. we will actually put this as a PDF in the uh, iPhone app. So anybody yeah. who um, Freebie, has yeah. the iPhone app will be able to get this worksheet for free. Um, cool. What I did was I tried to take a look at the the whole setup of what's going on, and it comes down to your total psychic ability, which is a number of points. Yeah, and the, the PSPs. points, the the what? PSPs, I think they're called psychic. Well, I just say psych, total psychic ability. So your total psychic yeah. points, and we won't go into all of the mechanics of how it's rolled, but it has to do with the fact that you have to be very high in either intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. Um, Mm -hmm. at least a 16 in one of them. And then if you manage to have two or even three of those over 16, you get all kinds of bonuses to it to the, to the point where after rolling your percentile die and adding in your bonuses, you could have up to 172, uh, points of strength. And that, that means you get the same amount. You get 170. Like, let's say you got 100 points, right? Okay. So you'd have 100 mm-hmm. points of attack strength and 100 points of defense strength, and you add them together to get your total psionic ability. So that's the first thing that I've put here on this worksheet, and I've kind of set it up almost like a battle tech card, meaning that yeah. as you use your a strength and defense in battle, your your ability goes down, and it has to be replenished through rest. And then, so that's the main core of the psionic um, thing is that you got this attack and defense strength, and you got five different modes of attack now, and defense. Now, don't forget, though, even before you, if you were creating a character from scratch with psionics, I mean, there, you're not just going to be able to get psionics right away. There's a, you have to do a yes. percentile roll to see if there's mm-hmm. the potential. It's exceedingly rare. Exactly, as it should be. Because some of these abilities, you know, hey, quite frankly, very, very powerful. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, you have to have a 16 in one of these uh, three attributes, which if you're rolling uh, straight official uh, ways of doing it that are in the DMG, even that's hard. But then if you do, then you've got to roll another percentile dice, and you've got to get a double zero. Now, it's modified. So mm-hmm. you get a few little bonuses, but um, even if you've got straight 18s in all three of them, which you really shouldn't, <laughs> unless something really, the, you know, the, the gods of the dice just smiled upon you. Um, but even if you did have straight 18s, you'd still only have, what, like a 15% chance of getting psionics? No, I don't, uh, I don't even, even think it's, I no. think it's less than that. No, I think they, uh, the example fun. they had in the book, the person had pretty good stats, and it was only 97 and a half. Right. Yeah, so you're so, not you're not likely to get psionics at all. But if you do get psionics, um like you said, that that's the first hurdle we get over. Yeah. Um now now I there are ways later on through through a wish spell if you raise one of your scores, you might even as a DM I would actually allow a wish spell to let somebody say I want to have a chance to roll for psionics, you know, if their scores were well, high. Yeah, and that was even brought up in the sage advice uh, mm-hmm. uh, when they that's say. like if 
if I read, uh, what is it, the Libram, wh whatever tome that makes you increase your intelligence or wisdom, mm -hmm. it's like, if I read that, my character reads that later on, could I ask the DM if I could and boost, my, boost my ability above 16, can I roll for psionics then? Cool. They said, absolutely. What about so, yeah, and, well, what about the all right? So fine, you do that. What about the person that says, "I wish I have psionic ability"? I don't think so. No, it's a wish That's, spell. Yeah, but a wish spell is not infinitely powerful, and there's a lot of articles, you know, and people have talked about what a wish spell can and cannot do, and this is all up to the DM's ruling. Well, Some DM may say that's fine to do it, but personally. I would rule that that wish was either so difficult that they couldn't do it, or I'd come up with some way to twist their words. Yeah, I think the twisting words would be fun. But oh yeah, I would just like say, okay, this ability is boosted the sixteen. Roll for it. <laughs> well, if, if to, okay, if by example, Vince, if if we were in a game right now and you said I'm going to use my wish spell, I wish I had psionics, then I'd say, okay, you used to have psionics. Ha ha ha. I mean, ah. so. <laughs> And you remember with fond memories those days yeah. when you had psionics. <laughs> well, but I, I do I like the fact the that I do think you should have a chance, you know, throughout the game. If you're going to have a game with psionics, I, I don't think it's right to only have that one exceedingly difficult role at the very beginning and no other chance ever. So I like the fact that you can, through extraordinary right. measures, have a chance at it. So more on your, your sheet here. This is Oh, right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. So, Sorry, uh, tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Uh, okay, so so the core is all about these attacks and defenses. And yeah. what's going on there, there's five different modes, and we won't get into all the specifics. You could read the player's handbook if you want to know. But these five different modes of attacks and defenses are uh, – this does get a little Jedi-like, and that's fine. So one – one player will use an attack and the other will use a defense and that defense gets mounted immediately. It's like an immediate, it's like a, a, a reflex. Um, as soon as someone's attacking you, you put up this defense without even thinking about it, although the player does get to choose. And it goes very fast because psionics, unlike melee, which is measured in rounds because you're figuring out you know, how much happens during a whole minute of trying to hit somebody with a sword, psionics are figured in segments. Yeah, Each it's thing very fast. It's only six seconds. Yep. Very fast. The um, speed of the although mind. very slow. I mean, in, in, the, in the game terms, I guess you could say it that way too, because it takes a long time to resolve a whole minute. Um, but while that's going on, you have essentially these two psionic uh, characters that are battling with their minds. And somebody drew a picture once in Dragon Magazine that said, Imagine like ball on a playing field and each one's trying to push the ball back and forth and if one of them ever gets it all the way into the other one's uh, end well then they've broken down their defenses so and then a lot of amazing stuff can happen to you if your defenses get broken down anything from instant death to being uh, feeble minded or being a robot completely under the control of the other person which is very right. fun um, and then there's the, 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 the other side part of psionics in addition to that combat between the two which is the psionic disciplines the major and minor disciplines or as they're also called devotions and sciences and these are the spell-like powers yeah like body equilibrium or exactly body so, weaponry body web if i have a, if i had a pc and had psionics and you said what's the one thing that you'd want definitely want to have as a, as a minor discipline body weaponry yeah, <laughs> I mean, there, when, you get to a, when you get to a high enough level of mastery of body weaponry, you could have a player character who was completely unarmed and yet could just start using their hand as a sword. That's amazing. That's Imagine really a monk amazing. with body weaponry ability with psionics. Probably why originally monks weren't allowed to have psionics. Right. <laughs> um, because that would be lethal. Yeah. So you have all of these spell-like abilities. And the things that are pretty neat about them is that you don't have to uh, memorize the spells the night before. You don't have to pray for the spells. You just have this power. It's mm -hmm. very draining. You're not going to be able to do it a lot. But it's that moment of spell point kind of like uh, things. Right, right. And uh, yeah, so so that's that's the other side of things, and of course, it brings in the other question, which is psionics versus characters or monsters that are not psionic. Um, the disciplines work on anyone, 
So right. if you have um, a particular discipline like body weaponry, the person that you're attacking doesn't need to have psionics to get hit by your right. your hand sword. Uh, however, for the attack and defense modes, you cannot attack a non-psionic with any attack other than one. But There's only psionic one. Psionic blast. Yes, and psionic blast is very costly. Um, and it's very powerful. <laughs> very devastating. So that's yeah. the basic structure mm-hmm. of psionics. It's 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 mind combat and manipulating the world around well, you. And just a little bit on psionic blast. When I was reading through in the DMG that chart where it shows, you know, psionics versus a non psionic person, when you mm-hmm. use psionic blast, mm-hmm. the percentile chance of just killing that PC or what have you. Um, yeah, instant death. Yeah, it's like it's a very it's, low yeah. chance. Um, although I guess if you have somebody who's using a uh, psionic, or sorry, you're talking about psychic crush now. Actually, no, uh, psionic blast. Uh, no, no, psychic crush has a percentage chance of instant death, but uh, not. Am I looking at the wrong? Did I look at the wrong one? Yes, yeah, okay. It's just the same idea, though. I mean, you have psychic crush, which is something that can uh, do instant death, and and. It brings up a really good point. I'm going to make a list of things that I did wrong when I was running psionics. Another one. I misinterpreted the rule on psychic crush. So in the book, it says that uh, – I, I don't know. We will look for word for word. But basically it says that uh, if you're using psychic crush, the only defense possible is thought shield. And now we're talking about attack strength or attack types and defense types. Um, and so I read that and said, well, if you're the only way you can defend against a psychic crush is with a thought shield. I read it backwards. Apparently, a lot of people read this backwards. Um, what it really means is that when you're using psychic crush, thought shield is the only defense you can maintain yourself. Right. Because right. thought shield is the only one that you can keep on using with while you do other stuff. And that was in the sage advice column. Did you pick up on that? That's where I did. So things yeah. I, things I did wrong, and I think this is you know reason that some people don't like psionics because it's easy to do these things wrong. Um, I gave major disciplines to first level PCs, uh, although I knew I was doing that wrong. To be fair, I just did it because I wanted them to have some fun. Um, I only charged one point per discipline instead of two. So there's another thing that can come up in terms of where people uh, get confused because you've got this attack strength and defense strength which add up to total strength, and you know it's a whole thing. Um, yeah. I misinterpreted the thought shield uh, uh, rule. So you'll hear, if you listen to my actual play, you'll hear me doing that one wrong. Um, I, at one point, subtracted from attack points when there was a defenseless psionic. Um, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, just, I subtracted from defense points rather than from attack points. So you see, um, that's easy to mess up. Um, and uh, I didn't use the range reductions for medium, short, or for medium and long range. So there's a lot of stuff you can do wrong. Uh, but, you know, if you've got players who are willing to um, be patient with you and, uh, and who are you know, willing to kind of get into the whole thing, after you've done it maybe a few times, you know, those problems will go away, just like any other rule problems, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess overall, if understanding how it works and – using it in gameplay, um, I guess it leads up to that final question. Is it something that you would use as is in the rules or, you know, with some other things, do you, like the Dragon Oracle, the Clarify, or do you want to... Well, you know, that's good. It at all? There is that yeah. whole uh, article in Dragon 78 called Overhauling the System. Yeah. So um, I won't go into the specifics here because I haven't really read the article closely enough because, honestly, I think that if you play it by the book, with uh, that, that it does work fine. I, m- I might change my tune a year from now, you know, when I've done this enough. But right now, I right. think by the book, psionics work fine. For me, I, I don't think I understand it well enough to use it correctly. I don't feel – It's okay, though. Even now, in, in, as – being my, you know, being 39 years old and being in this hobby for God knows how long, I still have uh, reservations using the psionic system as is. 
What about you, Vince? I mean, how do you, where do you you've been kind of silent on this? How do you see psionics? Uh, do you even use them? No. Uh, do you just leave it? That... I don't. I don't use them at all. I think they're. Too... Don't you want to go there? No, I don't. I don't use them at all. I think they're too. They're they're easy to use enough, but they're just take the whole fantasy element out of the game. Remind me too much of Star Wars, and if I want to play Star Wars, I'll play the infamous Saga Edition, which is a wonderful game. <laughs> dead game though. Yeah, dead game, but wonderful totally game. Well, dead game. Totally. Dead we game. like that. <laughs> now here's the here's now here's the thing on it. If here's a third option, maybe there's By the another. Way, don't nobody games. write in and tell us it's not a dead game. They still play it. We only say dead game like Dead Game Society. It's out of that's print. Right. Yeah. That's healthy, right. Yeah, it's healthy. It's alive. It's got a huge community. Dead games can be very alive. Just here's our disclaimer. Well, I just I, if, it. if I want to play if I want to play with something like this, I I would make a Thunder to Barbarian or play actually play Gamma World if I wanted well, to play this. There's there's a good point. Um, Alternate systems to if you want to bring psionics into AD and D, there's some alternate systems. Now, one of them, excuse me for saying this, is because I've considered using this system is the uh, the complete psionics handbook for second edition. Now, I've never seen this. I mean, tell me something about this. You know, we won't go into it too much, but what, what why? Well, first of all, why is there a whole book? Uh, second of all, <laughs> the soft because cover. initially when they did. Well, first, initially, when they did second edition, they left psionics intentionally out of the system as as a way to make money, a, uh, you know, <laughs> an option, a way to make okay? money. <laughs> that's why yeah, that's probably secondly, more like if they wanted to sell you another book. Yeah, that's exactly well, what it and was. And that too. But, I mean, uh, they oh, put I in there. Get... They, well, they also put in there the psionic uh, class, the psionicist. The psionicist? Uh, they it was like a psy- it's like a warrior or something, and. Well, I mean, uh, Psionicist was introduced in Dragon 78. It was just a uh, suggestion, and it was never made canon. Right, but, yeah, there was a revamp of it in the book, and it gives a little bit better, I think, a little bit cleaner explanation on how the abilities work, uh, at least in my opinion. But even more simple, more simple than that, is I found on dragonsfoot.org, um Gentleman goes by the name of Jeffrey on Jeffrey. the boards. Okay. And I want to give full 100% credit to Jeffrey for this. And he brought up the idea, and I think I talked about this a little while back. I think we, when we talked about the kind of crossover thing, is using Gamma World mental mutations as they are out of the Gamma World First Edition book. And let me give you a little explanation about this and how this would work. And he outlines it very well. He says, first, you go by the player's handbook in page 110 on seeing if the, the character has the potential of having psionics. Right. That's the first thing you do. Second, if the character has psionics, randomly give him one to four mental mut- mutations as per the first edition Gamma World mental mutations chart and list on pages 11 to 14 of the rulebook. If a defect is rolled, because you can get mental defects in the in the first edition Gamma World, re-roll until you don't get a defect. These psionic powers will stay unchanged as the character rises in level. Okay. Third, if a monster has psionics like uh, Sidu or a Sioux monster or what have you, uh-huh. simply count how many attack slash defense modes as listed in a monster manual. This is generally listed as a number from like, it should be like one to ten of them. Then replace these attack defense modes with an equal number of non-defect mental mutations from Gamma World. You can either assign them or generate them randomly. And you'll probably want to give the Mind Flayer the Mental Blast mutation as a, as a given. And it says for psionic combat, this is where I think the beauty of it is right here. For fourth point, simply use the mental attack matrix on page 20 of the Gamma World rulebook. The rules for mental combat are a mere four paragraphs on page 19. And use the monster's intelligence score for its mental strength score. That's it. No bookkeeping. No hundreds of points to keep track of. No half points to keep track of. No keeping hourly tabs of psionic points. It's quick, it's easy, and it's old school. And it doesn't feel like magic. <laughs> hmm. I, mean, it's, I it's, love it. It sounds pretty I good. Yeah. Honestly, I got a little confused through some of the stuff you were saying, probably because I was listening rather than reading it. But hmm. uh, the other thing is now that I've taken a little time to delve into the 
buy the book Psionics, I don't find them confusing, and I think they go very fast. I don't think I have to go through a lot of stuff. So that sounds okay, but I really don't think that they need any basic alteration like that. Well, I mean, for me, I think I would use the... I like Jeffrey's option. I really do. Well, let, let me ask you one thing about this, because there, there is one thing that... Uh, uh, there is one thing that comes up that a little bit of an issue, and that's the time scale difference. Because psionic, ba- psionic uh, battles are going on on a segment by segment basis, and melee and other things happen on a, a round by round. So when you start combining melee actions with segment actions, there's the opportunity for the DM to get a little bit overwhelmed or confused. Does that method that you just described, does that address that issue? I think it addresses it for the fact that uh, first, I, if I remember correctly, for the mental combat in um, Gamma yeah. World, it, it's just like you would do regular combat. I mean, uh, okay. there's, there's four paragraphs in the, in the book and it's fairly uh okay. easy to cra- the to grasp so well, i could cra- i could crack my just... gamma world book but i uh, i i guess it's worth people taking a look at if you have a desire to bring a psionic like uh system into your game but you don't want to use the uh the by the book first edition mm-hmm. approach. um although i'll just repeat that I think the buy the book first edition approach works pretty good. You just need to work out your bookkeeping system as a DM. Um, and I think that that's something that I have not solved. I didn't, don't think it was a solution that needed to happen, but I think I've addressed it pretty well uh, with the psionics worksheet. Yeah, I think and, it, I uh, think your sheet is perfect. I mean, if I was on the internet cruising around and I wanted to have a psionic game for my uh, game, and I saw the sheet, I, I'd probably print it out and be like, oh, cool. So this guy who did this for me. So yeah, I would think so too. If using yeah. the rules as is in first edition, having this worksheet helps tremendously. The biggest thing is that it takes the math away because yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what I did is I mean I put these rows of BattleTech looking ovals that are in rows of 5 so you can just count 5, 10, 15, 20 and just mark them off. Because when I tried to do this in my Skype game the other night without the worksheet and was trying to quickly add and subtract and you know put them in the columns, I had a mess. I mean, I was had nobody wants to hear the DM pull out the calculator. Yeah. That's that's not a good sign when the DM starts getting the calculator. Hey guys, can you tell me what all the factors of this prime number are? Oh God! Well, there aren't any. There's only two, but you know what I mean. No, <laughs> that was a trick question. The only factor of any. Prime See, number that's how much math I know. <laughs> but <laughs> wow. Anyway, so there there you have it. Um, psionics well, history A to Z. In a nutshell. So, yeah, to yes. so, to sum everything up, use it or leave it. Yeah, use it. Either. I say use it, but use a different system. <laughs> That's not the question, Nick. Use it or leave, leave it. it. I'm being a- completely ambiguous. <laughs> <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. Here. If you want to use it, I would rather use a different system for me. Well, the Rules as Jonathan, written. Jonathan, what have we done to your brain at this point? What do you, what do you think of this as an outsider? I think he's just been it's mind blasted. So. <laughs> it's what, Jonathan? I'm sorry? It's pretty mush right now in my brain. Yeah. I think he, <laughs> yeah, he's been mind blasted for sure. I, I vaguely remember reading the, reading these rules years ago, and my opinion was it, it just doesn't feel like d and it, it, feel, it feels sci-fi to me. So Thank you. Yeah. John, you get a free plug. Epicworlds.com. You get a free plug. Yes. Everybody gets a free plug. <laughs> Epicworlds.com. After right. now, you can set up. And Oh, yeah, I meant to ask you before about Epic Worlds. Uh, is there any to be more features added on with the uh, supporting member for Epic Worlds? Epic Words, excuse me. Epic Words. Uh... Yeah, sorry. I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry. Everybody, make sure you spell, spell it Epic Words. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're, we, we intend to come up with some more features, especially, uh, we definitely want to incent people to, to support the site, um, and, and coming up with more paid features, it definitely is on them, is on that list, but 
what they I, I gotta are... say though, for for twelve bucks a year, yeah, I mean, there's no ads on the site. There's no ads, right? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no I, I always run ad block, so I always have to go. Wait a minute, are there ads? Because I haven't seen any. Um, there's, you got no ads on the site. It's free for everybody, and the if you really want to pay twelve bucks a year, you get file storage and things like that. Well, the um, benefits. But to that. me, I mean, if you're using this thing all the time. Twelve bucks. That's that's a couple of you going out for breakfast, and you would do that for once a dollar a, a month. You I mean, two to can if, words. The you, way I like to put it is, you probably spend more on snacks at, at your games than you do uh, on Epic Words. So yeah, yeah, I mean, pay the twelve bucks. You're getting an ad free site for, for, for free. You know, pay twelve bucks. Yeah, but it is free if you don't want to. It's free for everybody. Uh, you yeah. Know, yeah, our snack account is like ginormous. Yeah. <laughs> See, you just got a free uh, plug. There you go. No. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave it. I, I have to agree with Mr. Uh, Jonathan there. I don't like it. It's too sci-fi-ish. If I want to play s- something sci-fi-ish, I'll go play uh, Weg Star Wars or Saga Edition, the best Star Wars game ever. Who, do, who Does anybody do a podcast about that? Um, No, I don't think so. I think there's a, you know, I, I've heard of one. I, I, oh, yeah, that's those guys. Yeah, what are 66? Yes, uh, you can find them at d20radio.com, our sponsors. Our network. Our network. There were sponsors. I'd be getting paid. Oh, you, you're not getting a paycheck? I was. Oh, what we'll do you talk mean I? What about we? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so psionics. I mean, I think that if you if you bring them into the game, they add a lot of flavor to it. And the most important thing to me about it is that you feel as a DM once you master psionics, if you decide not to use them, at least you're deciding not to use them because. Right. You didn't like the way they fit in, not because you didn't know how to do them like I was a month ago. So there's I just have... the satisfaction of knowing at least you know how to do it. Yeah. If I had a psionic character, I would name him Men Talk. Perfect. Be- Mind taken. I am Men Talk. <laughs> this looks to be on Star Trek. <laughs> All right. So I think that's enough about psionics. I think we've warped everybody's brains enough tonight. My no head hurts. Intended. What? My head oh, I thought someone said. No, never mind. I'm not going to repeat what I thought I heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth ra- raising our G rating. Bleep. Yeah, bleep is right. I just said my head hurts. Ah, <laughs> uh, huh. So that's going to wrap it up, and I guess that's going to bring us into creature feature theater. <laughs> Here we are in the Creature Feature Theater for tonight. And for tonight, I will be your DM, uh, DM Jason, going to be running the Creature Feature. And uh, Nick and Vince, you've got a couple of characters who have uh, who are making a reappearance here on the show. Uh, just uh, to keep us in line, uh, why don't you go ahead and remind me of who you're playing, Vince? Uh, Grimthar. Okay, Grimthar. And Grimthar is a fighter, is that right? Correct. Okay, Grimthar, who's a fighter. And Nick, you have? Cedric. He is a half-elf magic user cleric. Okay, Cedric, the half-elf magic user cleric. So mm-hmm. what we're going to do tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different. We, since we're talking about psionics here, we're going to give Grimthar and Cedric the once-in-a-lifetime chance to actually have psionics. Oh, uh, joy! <laughs> now, uh, normally, like we said before, the opportunity to have psionics is not just a matter of having good ability scores. You've also got to make that nigh-impossible roll uh, to actually do it. For All the right. sake of this, we're not going to bother with that role because oh. we want to actually go ahead and give it to them. So oh. first thing we need to do is make sure that their ability scores are high enough. To have psionics, you need to have a 16 or better in one of the following scores, wisdom, intelligence, or charisma. <laughs> Grimthar, got that. Has Grimthar got that? Grimthar is out. He does not. Okay, so we're going to need to adjust Grimthar so that he can be eligible for this particular uh, moment. So uh, let's just go ahead and give me give me the stats as we go down here, uh, and I'll I'll uh, we'll adjust in just a minute. Okay. Do you want to run down his uh, list? The whole entire starting from strength. Yeah, just give me strength through charisma. All the whole all right. Eighteen slash forty, 
14, mm -hmm. 15, mm -hmm. 10, 11, and 12. Okay, so in this case, what we're going to do, just for the sake of uh, getting this creature feature going, is we're going to boost, since his wisdom was closest to being the uh, one that was high enough, we're going to boost that wisdom up to 16. I'm not going to bother messing around with any of the other L um, attributes. We'll just say that it's 16. And uh, Cedric, you want to just give me a rundown on your attributes as well? Yeah, his strength, 13, intelligence, 16. Ha. Ah. Wis yep. Wisdom seventeen. Ooh. Double ha. Dex yep. Dexterity sixteen. Mm -hmm. Constitution eleven and charisma twelve. Okay. So um we're gonna run through a little bit of setting up this psionics worksheet. And uh okay. We'll probably go through and you know, edit it for speed afterwards so that our listeners don't have to listen to every single roll of this. But Jason, uh, hold I, my hand, I'm scared. It'll be all right. So the okay. first thing we need to do, we're going to assume that both of you made your roll to have psionics, and we're going to figure out your total psionic ability. And uh, we'll start with Grimthar because uh, he's on my left. So, Grimthar, the first thing you need to do is to roll a uh, percentile dice, and we're going to find out what your total psionic ability is. All right. You said percentile, right? Mm-hmm. I'm rolling it or you're rolling it? No, you go ahead and roll it. All right. Hold on. I have a 82. 82. Okay, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, to that 82, you're going to get a bonus. Okay. And the bonus is applied for any of your, uh, I'm going to just call them the three psionic attributes. Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. The three psionic attributes, for all the points above 12, you're going to get a bonus. So for Intelligence, you get two points of bonus, and for Wisdom, you get four points of bonus. So that's add six to the total you just told me. So 88. Okay, so you have 88. Now, on the psionics worksheet I gave you, you see down on the bottom left, you have maximum attack strength and defense strength. Right. Take that 80, what did you say, 88? Yeah. Take that 88 and write it in both of those. Okay, 80. So this... Done. So each of those is 88. They start out... Uh, this is the maximum you can have, and whenever you enter into psionic combat, you'll begin with that um, and work downwards from there. And then up at the top of the sheet, you see it says total psionic ability. So you're going to write those two added together, 176. Okay, done. So that's your total psionic ability. Now, I've set this up with the little circles like you can see here. So what you probably want to do is just where you, when you get to the row uh, that has 88 in it, um, just go ahead and mark the 88th circle. Fill it in on both of those. Because the way we're going to do this is you can just mark them off in descending order as you use up your points. All right, done. Okay. Now, you have to figure out what your attack modes are and what your defense modes for your attack modes and actually i'm gonna let's let's do you guys both at once so that we can kind of move this through a little more quickly uh oh, so nice. cedric, cedric same thing give me a percentile roll oh yeah out i just strength. did <laughs> what'd you get 96 okay now it's going to be even better than that because first of all set that 96 aside for a minute we'll come back to it okay First of all, we're going to take how many points you've got above 12 in your three psionic attributes. So you've got four bonus points for your charisma, because it's a 16. You've got... No, charisma. My charisma is actually 12. Oh, sorry. I read that. that I, you've got no bonus points there. You have four bonus points for your intelligence. That's a 16. Yeah. Five bonus points for your wisdom. That's a 17. So that's nine bonus points. But wait, so, uh, there's more. Ooh. You actually get to double that because you have two abilities that are 16 or above. So that'd be 22 added to that. Uh, right? Five plus four. Oh, nine. So 18 added. I'm sorry. See, there's the math already coming into play. Now, See? I just want to take a quick, quick little um, caveat here. Anybody who's listening, who's reading the player's handbook carefully will see that it says that you have to have two scores above 16 to get the double. Um, I personally read that differently. I say 16 or above um, because it's my fervent belief that that was the intent when it was written, <laughs> even though it might not say that there because it is so hard to get a 16 in the first place that if you require characters to have two 17s, 
then you're really encouraging munchkinism and people possibly even cheating on their die rolls. I just don't right. think that's the case. So in my game, 16 or above. Your mileage may vary. Feel free to write in and tell me how wrong I am. Okay, so... That's Jason will. at RFIPodcast.com. Correct. All right, so you take that 18, you add it to that 96 that you just had. Isn't that right? You had an 18 and yep. a 96. Yeah, uh, that'd be 114, right? Yep. Okay, so now in your attack strength and defense strength, put 114... Mm-hmm, in got it. each of those, and then put 228 up at the top. Got it. Okay. So um, just for reference, you could have had, if you had all 18s, and if you rolled the maximum, you know, double zero, you would have had 172 points in, in each, which is why that's the largest number you see on the sheet there. Got it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll for your attack modes and your defense modes, your minor and your major disciplines, and I'm just going to let you guys both kind of do this at once because there's some choosing involved. Um, for attack modes, both of you go ahead and roll a percentile dice and tell me what you get. Okay. Uh, blue. Oh, you can't see it. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> 75. All right. So you're going to have three attack modes. Okay. And I roll the 57. <laughs> you're going to have three, three attack, attack modes. modes. Okay, so um, you're both in the same range. And this is one of the things about psionics is that just because you have a very strong psionic ability doesn't mean you have a different number of modes because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a scientific thing. People don't understand how they get this. You just get it and you hope for the best. So um, you're going to choose those in a minute, but let's do the same for defense modes. Roll uh, percentiles, both of you, and let's hear what you mm-hmm. get. 32. So that's two, or sorry, three defense modes for you. And 30. So that is three defense modes for you. Very good. Wow. All right, so now you're going to get to choose these. All right, I chose uh, Sonic Blast, Mind Thrust, Psychic Crush. What's the other? And then the other side of things is your defense modes. There are five defense modes. One of them every psionic has to have, and that's the first one, which is Mind Blank. Mind Blank, okay. Mind blank. It only costs one point per usage. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, actually, here. Let's go ahead and fill in. Um, since you're doing yeah. this, you're on your worksheet. Now. I you fill chose in your attack- for my attack modes. I chose psionic blast, ego whip, and psychic crush. Okay. So Nick, fill out the appropriate forms on your worksheet there. So then defense modes. Uh, you've got to have mind blank. That costs one point, and it only protects the individual. Well, I chose mind blank, obviously. I mm-hmm. chose Mental Barrier, barrier and tire, Tower of Iron Will. Okay. Ran. So those are the ones I chose. Um, my additional two were the Thought Shield and Tower of Iron Will as well. Okay, great. And just so you know, I mean, if you guys stick close enough together, one person holding up the thought of the Tower of Iron Will uh, is sufficient for both characters, So and mm. whichever is more powerful. Um, we'll go ahead and roll for the um, Psionic Disciplines as well. You don't have to choose here. So the psionic disciplines, again, give me a percentile roll for each of you. I rolled an 83. Okay, that means you're going to have three minors and two majors. Okay. I rolled a 22. You're going to have two minors, and that's it. Okay. Now, um, you're both playing, I believe, eighth-level characters for the purposes of this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, right around there, a 6-6 six, six, uh, multi-class. Okay, so you don't get all of your minor and major disciplines right away. Uh, Vince, you're going to get all yours right away because um, it's – I won't go into like you know how many you gain at each level. But uh, Nick, how many did you have again? You had three and two? Three and two. Okay, so you'll have all three of your minors. I don't think you'll get either of your majors yet. And that's right. Um, yeah, you won't have any of your majors yet. So we'll only roll for your minors. And for this one, cool. I'll just go ahead and tell you what you roll because it'll be a little bit faster here because mm-hmm. you have to roll a D6 and a D12. So um, starting with Vince, yes. I've rolled a 3 and an 11. That means you have ESP. Okay. And you also have Domination. Yeah. Uh, domination is superb because it means you can actually attempt to dominate another creature um, and it's a pretty powerful one. It's not. It's not just like a suggestion. It's. It's actually pretty powerful. Nation of domination. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, with domination, uh, you can force the mind of another creature to accept signals from your own brain, causing them to do your will. And uh, if it's something that they they do get a saving throw, 
but you are able to do something totally against their nature or self-destructive. It just triples or even doubles or even triples the cost of you doing it. But you can actually try to dominate a creature into committing suicide. Um, so those are your two miners. And then, Nick, you have got, uh, let's see here, mind over body. Hmm. And mind over body is a discipline that allows you to uh, go without food, go without water, those type of things, uh, for longer than normal. You become a spark. Uh, exactly. Uh, you also have... Uh, wait, Cedric's a... Magic's a cleric. So yes, you also have empathy, ah. which means that you can uh, understand the basic needs, drives, or emotions of any unshielded sentient mind. Cool. Uh, and then finally, you have cell adjustment. Nice. With cell adjustment, you can psionically attune to the cells of an injured creature to heal them. So that can be a very useful thing to have if you're in a party. S- especially for a cleric. It's very appropriate. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's – and your level of mastery is the only other thing on the worksheet that was left out. That is your your level. So eight six. for Grimshar, six for Cedric. Cool. All right, so you guys are all set up. Um, just a little bit about how the psionic combat works. Psionic attacks and defenses happen simultaneously, and the only reason that I'm going to roll initiative is so that we can determine who is the attacker and defender the first go-around. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure if that's the way you're supposed to do it, but that's the way I've been doing it. So, again, people can write in and tell me if any of this is going massively, massively wrong. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Cedric and Grimthar, you have been adventuring and adventuring and conquering and slaying all manner of creatures, and finally, freshly rested, you triumphantly stroll through (laughs) an innocent-looking passage in deep rock several, several hundred feet below the earth. Nothing can cause you trouble now, can it? No. You well, of course approach, so. you, as, you, uh, as you stroll confidently through the tunnels, you see ahead of you a large open cavern, uh, which is seemingly empty ahead of you, other than a lake, which is filling up about half of the room. This is a large, maybe 100 foot by 100 foot cavern, and the lake is, well, pond, really, um, taking up about half of the center of the room. Uh, okay. So I leave it to you how you wish to enter this cavern. Hmm. I charge in sword blazing. Ah! No, I'm kidding. To the empty cavern. <laughs> yes. I walk yes. in cautiously. Okay. Um, so Grimthar is leading the way, Cedric behind him. And the very first thing that occurs is that Grimthar, you feel a, a, a sort of a, a pressure inside of your skull as though rather than a headache coming from the outside it's coming from the inside pushing out and it requires you to now make a saving throw <gasps> versus magic Ew. And you don't see anything going on this is the first thing that happens I failed wow this will be a short one for you <laughs> you have been dominated yes <laughs> I'm the one that Why? only dominated Okay. I fail. What are you going to do? Yes. Okay. So right off the bat, um, first thing that has happened is you have been dominated, and uh, you are going to turn around. Should I I make it even better for you, Jason, with the one that I rolled? (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) How much of a domination is that? (laughs) A massive domination. Um, You actually choose to... Let me just see how many strength points this costs to do this to you. Okay, so you now are actually uh, going to be dropping your sword and and uh, tossing off your armor and and heading running for the lake. Woo-hoo! So that's that's what Grimthar is up to at this point. Uh, the juice. Leaving only, <laughs> so leaving only Cedric to wonder why his companion has suddenly gone swimming. Hmm. Okay. Um, Come on in, buddy. It's cold. Uh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I am. Is it 
is it dark in the cavern? Uh, the, there is a light that seems to come from a, a high ch- chimney above. You can't really see what the light source. But it's is, not. But it's, it's not too well lit, huh? It's enough for you. To, it's not like daylight, but it's it's more like a, the the light of sort of a dusk. Okay. A late hmm. dusk. Well, I guess. Well, I'm gonna walk. Wa- I'm going after Grimthar. I'm like Grimthar. What? <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> All right. So you're running. Towards Grimthar, are you going to try well, to? Well, I'm not uh, running. I'm kind of like cautiously he's walking running. in. Well, he's running. He's run well, into the. He has he has actually leapt into the lake now. He's. Well, I go to the edge of the lake. About. I walk okay. to the edge of the lake. I'm like Grimthar. What the heck are you doing? Okay, so um, I'm cuckoo for cocoa puffs. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> All right, yeah. then I need you to roll a saving throw as well as you begin to feel the same. Uh, crushing. <laughs> Don't fail, Nick. Unless this is going to end. <laughs> uh, this could be end real quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, right, saves. Very good. Okay. Uh, fourteen. Was that enough? I think it sounds like it was enough. Vers- versus what? Magic. Versus spell. Yeah. Oh yeah, made it. Yeah, okay. spells eleven. So I, I rolled a fourteen. Yeah, I'm good. All right, so not only have you saved, but you're, you're keenly aware of a presence in the room, another psionic power like your own. That is, There's a disturbance of force. Mm. Now, at that same time uh, that that, that, that uh, attempted domination happened on you, it was released from, from Grimthar. So, Grimthar, you are in the lake. Your, your things are back uh, near the entrance. You have no armor and no weapons, but you're not dominated anymore. Mm? Uh, what you do see is that on a high ledge above, uh, about 10 feet above the uh, entrance where you came in and about 20 feet back, you now see uh, what you failed to notice coming into the room and what has clearly uh, <coughs> focused its attention on you is a large humanoid-like creature who looks very much like a copyright violation that seems to remind you of something. He has uh, <laughs> tentacles <laughs> He has a tentacled face and uh, a bit of an octopus head. Oh my god, it's a copyright mm. monster! And now... <laughs> it's a wizard We're being of the attacked coast. by Cthulhu. Okay. <laughs> Although you're not, because then the lawyers would show up. So, uh... <laughs> wow. Totally yes. ri- totally ripping on your favorite cartoon, our uh, web strip, huh? Exactly. <laughs> Um, order of the stick listeners you'll know what's going on yeah all right so it's at this point that we enter into psionic combat and boy, oh, boy, we will oh, roll we will roll a uh, initiative for uh, okay three versus monster i have rolled a two give me your d6 we're going for low here uh should i, I should roll then yeah go ahead yeah, sure. i'm in the water i rolled a three okay so now again, this is we talked about house rules before. I always go for low being the initiative just because it makes my life easier. So this mm-hmm. two does go to your opponent, and now we begin the psionic combat. You're both going to be able to do this, even though you're in the water and you're unarmed. That doesn't prevent you from using the awesome powers of your mind. Now we're going to work this out on a segment-by-segment segment basis. So I'm breaking this down into ten segments, and all of this happens on the first one. Each segment, you're going to have the opportunity to launch an attack um, after you defend. Um, now, okay. there's some uh, controversy, I guess, or maybe at least discussion going on over whether or not player characters can um, have to choose their defense or can be given the best defense possible automatically. But if we're going by the book, it's only monsters get to do that. So you guys are going to have to choose your defenses. So each segment as we go through, I'm going to write down what the attack and defense modes I'm using are. And then you need to tell me what the ones you're using are. And uh, I promise to be fair about the ones that I'm, you know, writing down behind here. And we will uh, resolve this on a segment by segment basis. Make sense? Okay. Makes sense. Okay. so So you're getting attacked first. So, uh, both I got to do a defense. Me, both of you tell me your defenses. And this is from the defense modes that you chose a minute ago. Okay. All right. So, uh, Vince, yours first. Uh, Which defense uh, mode will you throw up? Thought shield. Thought shield. Okay. And Cedric, what will you throw up? Tower of Iron Will. 
Okay, Tower of Iron Will. So the first thing I want you to do is on your defense strength on your worksheet here, take off the number of points. You know, mark them down however you want to do that so that you so you keep track of the fact that you just spent those points. So I'm down to 104. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and attack you with a psychic or is this a psionic attack of some type? You don't know necessarily what it is. And uh, this psionic attack is going to go first against Grimthar. And now this is where it gets a little bit different because we're not going to roll anything. I'm just going to tell you what the actual outcome of this attack versus that defense happens to be. So when I look over here at the chart and I start with uh, what the psionic attack is and I go against... I would normally go against your thought shield, but in fact, the Tower of Iron Will surrounds... uh, Yeah, you're close enough. The Tower of Iron Will surrounds... Is that a... Yeah, it surrounds you both. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I apologize. You know what? It's only got a three-foot radius. For right now, we're going to go ahead and stick with what you actually put up, which is your thought shield. And that thought shield was not incredibly effective. Mm. The attack knocked 21 points off of your defense strength. Oh, ow. So in addition to the number of uh, points that you just knocked off before, I don't know how many that is, a two, I guess. Yeah. At, take off another 21. Done. Okay, and now that attack's only going against you because he can only attack one of you at a time. So uh, both of you now tell me what your attacks are going to be in return uh, I'll do a psychic blast psychic blast Nick okay I'm going to do psionic blast as well oh it's psionic sorry I thought it was psychic blast so that's 20 points um, okay psionic blast for both of you mm-hmm. okay so now the uh, creature throws up his defense <laughs> he's going to throw up all right Yes, he's throwing up defenses left and right. Um, and let's see. In this case, now just so you know, the way that it works is that the, the monster will always use the best defense possible. That's just by the book. Sure. So um, he throws up his defense, and for this I need to know what your strength is, your, the total attack strength before you subtract the points. Uh, uh, um, right, so then you go yours first. 88 is my total strength. Okay. So, um, all right. I'm going to mark off the amount of damage that just did to him. One, two, bang, bang, bang. Okay. And uh, Nick? 114. 114. Okay, so that psionic blast knocks off this many. It knocks off 18 points here, so that's 2, 12... Wow, that's uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Wow, that's some powerful attacks that you guys just nailed him with. Good. Okay. Um, I'm not going to keep on doing um, initiative for every segment because that would just bog us down a little bit too much. So um, the next go around, I need to know what your defenses are going to be. If you're going, if you want to just keep the same defense up, that's fine, or if you want to change it, whichever. I'm um, maintaining Tower of Iron Will. I'm gonna now, throw, do I yeah. do I knock off another ten points again? Yes, exactly. So you knock off another ten points, and uh, just so you know, if you want to su- surround both of you with that, you're going to have to. Well, no, you're, the the thing is, you're not close enough to each other at this point. Right. If you want to be able to surround him as well, the iron. Do you have the uh, um, intellect fortress? No, I have mind blank and mental barrier. Otherwise. Okay, so you're both just going to have to mount your own defenses throughout. Yeah. So you're sticking with Tower of Iron Will? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to throw that up because the last time my Thought Shield did not uh, help me, so. So you're switching to the Tower of Iron Will? Yes. Okay, so go ahead and take 10 defense points off for each of you. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Done. All right, and so the attack comes in on both of you. And, uh, of course, I had marked his attack on the wrong side. Sorry. Okay. The attack comes in on both of you. Knocks him down this many more. Isn't that fun to hear me say this many because I'm not telling you the numbers? But Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, attack comes in on both of you. And 
against a Tower of Iron Will only does two points of damage to each of your defenses. Oh, good. Good, okay. Okay. Uh, you now have the opportunity to um, attack. I'm going to Psionic Blast his butt. Yeah, I'll okay. do the same thing again. Okay, so Psionic Blasts. Now tell me what your attack strength is before you took the points off for this one. 68. Okay. So 68, and I look over here, and I pull the total amount of damage that does to him, which, uh, let's see here. So that knocks him down. Okay, got it. And Nick, what was your total strength? Uh, 95 before that. Okay, 95. So that is really really pretty powerful because you're a whole uh, section higher than him. You're knocking him down pretty far at this point. And now we're only... That was only two segments that have passed so far. We've only had wow. 12 seconds elapsed because this thought battle goes on faster than uh, regular melee does. Mm. And uh, next next time around, what are you putting up for your defenses? You know, I think I'm going to maintain that tire, Tower of Iron Will. That seems like the best thing so far. So Yeah, same thing for me. Okay, so what we'll do is just tell me if you want to change it. Okay. So otherwise, and we'll I'll maintain assume- our points. Got it. So each, yeah, so each segment take off the uh, 10 points off of your defense strength that it requires to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, so the first thing is that the, the same attack hits you again, this, this um, just overwhelming, um, you know, just shocking attack to your mind. And in these cases, it is doing, let me take a look at the, at the strength here. Uh, only one point of damage oh. to your defenses because he oh. is also his mind is also beginning to to wear down. Oh, a I bit. misread my sheet. I meant uh, ninety four last time, not ninety five. Is that much of a difference? No, it's in the same bracket. But thank okay, you. Okay, okay, okay. I I was off by a point. Okay, so as this goes on, his mind is also beginning to to wear down a little bit, and uh, the attacks that you're going to use. I'm going to psionic blast him again. Yeah, me too. Okay, tell me your strength. 74. Okay, 74. That knocks you... You're down in the lower level now, so it's not quite as bad for him, but still not a wonderful time. And I have 48. You're down to 48. So, uh, again, not as powerful as before, but you're still wearing him down. And we go into the next segment. You're keeping your defenses up as it were, as they were. Uh, and again, you have one point of damage done to each of your defenses. Okay. Okay. And go hit him back with your attacks. Mind thrust. Uh, mind thrust. Okay. What was your strength? 28. Okay. You're down to 28. And okay. It doesn't seem to have a lot of effect, but it's clearly getting through his defenses a little bit. And uh, Nick... I'm going to psionic blast him again. Oh, he you have broken his defenses down completely. You nice. now have you now have a defenseless psionic in front of you. Ooh. Okay. So, uh in the next segment, you are both going to get hit again with an attack. He may be defenseless, but it doesn't mean he cannot attack. And uh let me just take a look here at something that he can do. I uh, yeah, you're going to um Vince roll a saving throw versus magic. All right. And I made it. Okay. So you feel you can feel his mind reaching out for yours trying desperately to dominate you one more time, but it fails. You're too strong for him to Ain't gonna uh... happen, sucker. <laughs> That's right. And uh go ahead and mount your attacks. Mount your attacks. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there, which... So he's defenseless now? Yes. Blast. Oh, this is where you might want to whip out the psychic crush, right? Uh, you could do... I mean, really, there's a lot of things that can do damage here. Blast. Um, now, just so you know, um, uh. when, you, when you attack a defenseless psionic, I have to start taking the points off of his attack column. So, you know, you can take a lot of points off of him, but... Um, you're really lucky if you get one of the ones that has a letter because that means I mean you don't know what this table is, but there's opportunities for you to do things that are just you know immensely 
terrible well, to him. I know with a psychic crush, there's okay. a percentage chance I could just kill him. Yes. So I'll try. You enough, how's your attack strength doing right now? I am. I am at thirty four right now. Okay, and what's the psychic crush going to cost you? Fourteen. All right, give it a shot. So, so you're. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, thirty five minus fourteen is. Oh God. Uh, oh. Twenty one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, so your psychic crush. Now, when he, what I do now is I actually figure this against his total psionic strength, what he had to begin with. And I look over here, and I see that you have a 40% chance of instantly – oh, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I read it wrong. 30% chance of instantly killing him. So I'll let you roll the dice. Oh. All right. I'll be honest. Kill I know you will. Kill okay. Him. Kill please, him. below 30. Kill please, him. before 30. 13. Yeah. Yes! Amazing. And you I swear to God, I rolled a 13. He oh collapses. God. He collapses into a pile of dead flesh before you. And oh, you can, his head you doesn't feel like scanners. <laughs> you just feel the desperation because you know that he was probably just moments away from fleeing entirely into another dimension. And uh, you have been victorious over everybody together now. The Homer Simpson. Oh. The Mind Mind Player. Player. Player, yes. Sipilid. Yes. <laughs> All right. So there, you've had some psionic combat. So as wow. that um, was actually kind of easy. Yeah. But you as, know, with the worksheet, I like it. Yeah, it's yes, easy. not so bad. But so the, guys, go ahead. As yeah. we normally do, we talk about this next time. That's yeah, right. let me let me just tell you a little bit about the combat that went on. We'll talk about the creature itself next time. Oh, okay. But just so you know some things about how the combat was going. Um, when you're doing a psionic combat, the monster will always mount the best defense possible. So I was right. choosing his defenses based on uh, the one that was the highest point cost and the best uh, defense against what you were doing. You were wearing his defense strength down very fast, but his attack strength stayed pretty good. So had you uh, chosen... Uh, some type of attack mode when he was defenseless that merely wore down points, there was a good chance that you could have run out of points yourself before you got him down. So you chose really well by uh, deciding to take the chance for instant death on him right there. Well, it was either that or I was going to cast Fireball and blow him up. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, which I would have actually made you wait until the next round for. Yeah, it was either Fireball or Lightning Bolt. Like, oh, the heck with this. <laughs> Oh, so uh, there you have it. There's there's psionic combat for you. Woo woo. So his head didn't blow up like in scanners. Yeah, mm. maybe next time I'll have his head blow up. Now that I know how much you want that to happen. Well, that's yeah. what, kind of the whole idea, you know, like in scanners. Uh, yeah. So next next week when we talk about the creature, we'll talk about what he would have done if he had not been uh, brutally and savagely and mercilessly killed by you at that point. So and, mind flayer deserves to die. Yeah. <laughs> the and, and if anybody if anybody's seen Zombieland, we can do the rule double tap. I'm gonna psychic blast him just for the hell of it. There you go. Double, <laughs> double tap him just to be sure. Just to be sure. All right. All right. So I believe we ran that pretty well. Um anybody who's listening, if you uh would like to write in and tell us uh maybe what we did wrong or what we got wrong or what we got right or just what you think of Cyana Combat, let us know. RFI staff, gmail.com, or jason at rfipodcast.com. Ooh, one of those electronic voting deals. And uh, guess what? That's going to put a wrap on the show this week. A nice long show about that awesomeness. That was good. I liked our wrap about psionics, man. Yeah. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. Uh, the, uh, closing thoughts. We still have our poll up for Low Tech Con, so... Uh, Please go to the site and vote so Jason knows what day to pick. But I think we're still in the November date as the lead right yeah, now. Yeah, actually, it's tied with November, and I don't plan to attend. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get the marketing going, and we'll let people know. But, uh, yeah, we, I, I think really at this point the date is – I might take the poll down soon because I think the date is definitely going to be next autumn so that we have yeah. a full so – we, so we can have well, a full yeah. year to prepare. Uh, and there's you a know lot what? of stuff. On, yeah. on that, I mean – October date is one vote behind. Yeah, well, so we'll so, see. Um, you know, but October we'll definitely November, be doing some. Yeah. So go okay. v- go vote. Vote often like Jason does. And uh, 
I think that's going to close us out for this week for an extra long special show. Stay tuned next week as we go back to uh, regular, like normal show length, uh, and we'll have our wonderful segments back, or features, I should say. And uh, keep it original, keep it old school, and just to annoy Nick, keep your clerks with blunt weapons. Hey. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> for initiative.